Welcome to our new video series, A Beginner's Guide for Brands. What is Embedded Finance? In this video series, powered by Finastra, we speak to a series of experts to take a closer look at banking as a service, the scale of the opportunities provided by Embedded Finance, where it's already having an impact, partnerships, and actual use cases. So it's episode three in our video series powered by Finastra, a beginner's guide for brands, what is embedded finance. Today I'm joined by Jonathan McPhail, lead client partner, banking as a service at Finastra. So very well placed to, to speak to these things. And we're going to be talking about embedded cross-border payments. So, Jonathan, let's start with just an overall view of, obviously you're focusing on, on particular business challenges. What are some of the challenges that businesses face when operating internationally? And crucially, what impact has technology and innovation had on addressing those challenges in recent years? Well, I think the, the main challenges that business have with operating internationally is just the, the very simple fact, we don't, we don't need to really go past it, is that they're paying out of currency. So they're making, instead of operating only in their own currency and domestically, which you know, these days is quite straightforward, we're all used to very fast, very you know, real-time payment capabilities that, that our either our banks or our fintechs we use as individuals or as businesses provide. That's just not available as often with international payments. It brings about an additional complexity uh, and additional cost. And if you look at businesses that operate internationally, they'll generally have a, uh, a longer time to get paid uh, when they have customers that are, are abroad and are paying them in other currencies, and they'll have a higher cost to get paid as well. So it means that you get paid as a business, you get paid slower if you're receiving funds, or if you're making payments, it's going to cost you more to pay your suppliers. And so you know, it seems quite straightforward, but these are you know, relatively large challenges for, for businesses uh, that will impact them if they try and uh, operate internationally. However, we do see that uh, the technology in terms of uh, platform providers, so be they finance platforms or treasury platforms, or whoever you know, the, these companies are that are offering businesses digital services and digital ways of operating, they're starting to, to bridge the gap uh, and provide them with tax advice or with ways of accessing uh, payment service providers. Great, so we're starting to see a little bit of innovation come into this space to address some of those challenges that you just outlined. But when it comes to embedded finance in particular, how does that provide an opportunity to build on that and deliver a better payments experience or well, an easier payments experience? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think it, it follows on directly that as the way that companies operate becomes more digital and there are providers, again, who are providing them with tax advice or you know, ways of, uh, of accessing buyers in, in different countries or even e-commerce platforms if they're selling uh, on marketplaces. You know, as those places they operate become digital, they then become the perfect places to embed financial services, including payments. And so if you're selling across border, on an e-commerce platform, for example, you're gonna get paid in multiple currencies, which means you have to be able to operate multiple currencies. Or similarly, you know, if, you're, if you're importing uh, goods to then sell, uh, you're gonna to have to pay your suppliers in different currencies. But if all of these interactions start to happen on a digital platform, um, then you, you'll have a much easier way of initiating the, the cross-border payments either to your suppliers or, or ways of receiving different currencies from the buyers. So it's really the digitalization of the business and their processes and how they operate that's, that's providing those places in which we will actually embed uh, financial services, you know, specifically cross-border payments. So, and it sounds like in addition to easing the access to those products, and putting them in the context where they're needed, are you also broadening the access to them? So is it more open, you know, we think of kind of big multinationals, but would that also broaden access for SMEs, for example? Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think that's where we see the biggest change is SMEs are taking on these digital platforms to manage their business and facilitate uh, broadening of, their, of, the, uh, of the countries that they sell to. 
But I think the, the key though to remember is that it's, it's not just the SMEs and digital platforms that, that need to advance to facilitate cross-border payments. It's also the banks and the way that they connect and the way that they embed their services, uh, but also the way that banks fulfill those requirements as well. And, and we've seen that you know, there have been a lot of uh, correspondent banks that have, have drawn out of the market and no longer want to offer as broader range of currencies. You know, it's very expensive to, to offer uh, some of the, the different currencies and, and uh, corridors that they may have in the past. And so this is another area where we at Financial have seen uh, different providers come into the market uh, to, to take up the, um, the, the gap left by correspondent banks but also provide you know, better services than, than may have been available in the past with that SWIFT-based correspondent business. So that's really interesting when, you're, when you mention that banks are withdrawing from some of these spaces, creating additional gaps to what, you know, adding to what may have existed previously. Yeah. What are some of the other benefits of embedding cross-border payments? And can you give us some examples? Sure, I think the, the, the key to consider is that you know, in, the, in the past, if, if payment wasn't embedded, you're, you're doing something relatively manual outside of your process. But if you start to get this all into the, again, the business platforms that you operate in, you can start to look further ahead. So you can start to, to plan your, your currency needs ahead of time. You start to look at, at maybe covering some exposure you, you have coming up in two months time or three months time rather than just looking two or three days ahead of time. So the more that we have the, the cross-border payments and, and liquidity uh, embedded in the business platforms that companies use to, to manage their business, the more they'll be able to access risk services that provide additional products uh, from financial institutions to cover, the, to cover those risks. So again, simple things in, in FX like uh, forwards and swaps as opposed to just using uh, you know, payment services. So you've given some great examples of the value um, to different stakeholders of embedding cross-border payments. But what's the size of this market? Can you give us a sense of that? I think the, the, the cross-border uh, payment market globally is enormous. Uh, the, if you look at all the use cases together, it comes up to about $165 trillion worth of, of, of value a year. Uh, obviously, if you break that down, the largest segment by far is, is business to business. Uh, that's around 150 trillion, uh, but uh, you can look beyond that into the use cases that, that are really impacting uh, the way that people interact with cross-border payments and consider remittances, you know, individuals paying uh, other individuals across borders. That could be, for example, expats paying their family back at home uh, in, in the currency that, the, that, uh, that their, their home country uh, accounts their, their family hold. Or if you look at uh, business to consumer, that's a lot around payroll, uh, international payroll or uh, international pension payouts from governments uh, or, uh, or um, uh, dividends if you have, uh, if you have funds invested uh, in, in, in another country. Uh, all, and you put all these different, uh, these different use cases together and as I said, it, it does add up to an enormous amount. Uh, but you know, it, going through the correspondent network has meant that these payments are slow and relatively expensive. Embedding these cross-border payments and using alternative rails as opposed to SWIFT, uh, including the, the last mile, mile settlement, is going to provide a lot of value to, to this market. That's absolutely fascinating. And yes, that is a very big number. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on that and really giving us a sense of the scale of the opportunity. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much.